Hello, friends, and welcome to Community Presbyterian Church and our home worship service for February 20th, 2022. As more restrictions lift, it is our hope to begin doing more mission work in our communities and beyond. If you would like to participate in these discussions and planning of this ministry, please contact me and I will let you know when the committee will be meeting. If you are wishing a pastoral visit, those are available. If you contact me, we can make arrangements so that they can be set up. I look forward to seeing you all in one way or another soon. Let us take a moment to quiet our hearts and minds as we prepare to worship God. Let us join in our call to worship responsibly. Take delight in the Lord, for God will give us the desires of our hearts. Trust in the Lord, for God will give us security and strength. Come, let us commit our ways to the Lord. Let us worship the one who is our refuge in any time of trouble. Let us join in our opening hymn. Come before God in prayer. Faithful God, you have gathered your people in faithfulness throughout many generations. You have offered your blessings to us through their examples and led the church through many changes and challenges by your spirit. Draw near to us this day to guide us in these uncertain times. Root our faithfulness in the compassion and courage we meet in Jesus. Renew us through your steadfast love so that we may dare to trust our future to you. All praise and honor are yours, O God, source, savior, and spirit of life. Gracious God, you test the mind and search the heart so you know the thoughts and intentions we keep hidden. Trusting in your wisdom and mercy, we confess the ways we have failed to love one another, the times we looked the other way when someone needed help, and the ways our actions betrayed your goodness. Forgive us for missing opportunities to share your love and carrying grudges that keep us from offering the forgiveness 
we hope for. Lord, in silence, now we bring our personal confessions to you. Gracious Lord, renew us with your mercy to become more merciful to others we meet. In the example of Christ our Lord, this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear and believe the good news. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone and new life has begun. Trust that you are forgiven by God's generous love and have the courage to forgive one another for Christ's sake. Thanks be to God. As we prepare to hear God's word, let us pray. God of wisdom, your word brings life and hope. By the power of your spirit, open our minds to understanding, teach our hearts to love, and strengthen our wills to follow Jesus your living word, as we pray in his name. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 45, verses 3 to 11 and 15. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. And when he had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me, you, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have. I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. And in verse 15, And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God within us, for the word of God around us, thanks be to God. Now let us join in our next hymn.
This morning on this Sunday following Valentine's Day, I want to talk about forgiveness. Now to offer you some insight into the twisted nature that writing a sermon can take, I will connect these two subjects. On the morning of February 14th, I noticed a Facebook post from a ministry colleague. He shared a photo of the red and white bouquet he had purchased for his wife. The bouquet consisted of red and white kitchen utensils displayed in lovely glass measuring cups. Now, the experienced remarried man in me knew this was a serious mistake by my friend. But knowing his wife, and the fact that he was still able to post and comment as the week progressed, told me that he had been forgiven. People often mistake forgiveness for a feeling, but it goes much deeper. Basically, it boils down to a choice, an act of free will. A prime example of forgiveness from the scriptures is Joseph. Joseph, the elder of the two sons of Jacob by Rachel, comes to the pages of the biblical account at age 17. He is first seen tending his father's flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, Jacob's other wives. The biblical account does not go into detail about what happened while in the fields, but Joseph comes back from helping tend the sheep with a bad report about his brothers. Jacob loved Joseph and favored him over the others because he was the youngest and was born to Jacob in his old age. Jacob enjoyed spoiling Joseph. After the incident with the bad report, Jacob infuriates his other sons by giving Joseph a long tunic with sleeves that young people of the richer class wore. The hatred of Joseph's brothers increased when he related a dream he had that all of the family would bow down to him. This insult wedged the relationship between him and the others to a breaking point. Genesis 37 tells us that Joseph's brothers had gone to graze their father's flocks near Shechem, and Jacob asked Joseph to go check on them and their exact location. After arriving there, he discovered that they had moved their flocks to greener grass toward Dothan. Notice the drama of the scene. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them near Dothan. But they saw him in the distance, and before he reached them, they plotted to kill him. Here comes that dreamer, they said to each other. Come now, let's kill him and throw him into one of these cisterns and say that a ferocious animal devoured him. Then we'll see what comes of his dreams. Reuben, the oldest of Jacob's sons, discovered what was being said and quickly stopped their murderous plot. He devises a plan to throw Joseph into an empty cistern and plans to return and rescue him. When Joseph arrived at the site, he was seized, stripped of his prized robe, and thrown into the cistern. Reuben returns to the flock. But while he was gone, a caravan of Ishmaelites on their way to Egypt passes by. Brother Judah decides, why not make some money on the side by selling Joseph as a slave for 20 shekels? When Reuben returned, he discovered what had been done and immediately tore his clothes, a Jewish sign of being totally distraught. Another plan was devised, to lie to Jacob, telling him that his favorite son was dead. One sin leads into another. 
Joseph's life after these events changed forever. He ended up as a slave. He was lied about and was imprisoned for a minimum of two years in Egypt. And after a second two years, Joseph's deliverance came. After several years and a complicated series of intrigue, Joseph meets his brothers once again. He is no longer the same Joseph in physical appearance. The years of hardship have taken the edge off of his arrogance, and God has worked on his heart as well. He could have been bitter and hated his brothers, but forgiveness ruled. Forgiveness involves acknowledging your hurt, releasing your thoughts about the violation, and giving up the desire to pay the offender back. Forgiving has more to do with our own spiritual and mental health than it does with the one who has hurt you. Forgiving releases that person from your wrath. But more importantly, it frees you from the bondage of unforgiveness. Forgiveness releases us from the bondage of an unforgiving spirit from anyone, a mother, father, sister, brother, son, daughter, colleague, pastor, church member, or anyone else. The principles of forgiveness remain steady. Today's scripture lesson reveals some of those basic principles. God helps us break the cycle of an unforgiving spirit as we acknowledge our attitude. Dr. Norman Wright states that if we don't forgive, that means we are carrying resentment and bitterness. Resentment and bitterness mimic a physical cancer that eats away at the healthy body cells and can cause death. Resentment and bitterness can destroy our emotional, psychological, and spiritual life if unchecked and unhealed. The New Testament word for bitterness is from the root peak and means to cut or prick. Literally, it is pointed, sharp, or pungent in its actions and feelings. Bitterness manifests itself as prejudice, an acrid tongue, exaggerated lies, and revenge. Chuck Swindoll illustrates in his book, Seasons of Life, where he writes that during his time in the Marine Corps, he and his wife rented a studio apartment from a man in South San Francisco named Mr. Slagle. During World War II, Mr. Slagle was captured and for years he languished in a prison camp. It was in this prison camp that an enemy soldier struck him with a rifle butt and injured his back, which plagued him for the rest of his life. Swindoll tells that every single time he visited his landlord, he would relate story after story of how barbarically he had been treated. Using vile language and intense emotion, he spoke of the tortures he endured at the hands of his Japanese captors and his utter hatred for them. His pain and misery were constant reminders of his hatred. But there was another factor which made his existence even more lamentable. Our landlord became a bitter man even though he was 13 years removed from the war. 
even though he had been safely released from the concentration camp and was now able to carry on physically. Even though he and his wife owned a lovely dwelling and had a comfortable income, the crippled man was bound by the grip of bitterness. He was still fighting a battle that should have ended years before. In a very real sense, he was still in prison. You cannot conceal bitterness because it raises its ugly head often. The root of bitterness bears the fruit of bitter actions. Bitterness imprisons us as we refuse to forgive a friend, a relative, or stranger for a sinful, foolish, or sometimes ignorant act. Inner torment will ride alongside us every day of our lives until we forgive. When we decide to disclose the problem to Christ, that is the beginning of forgiveness and healing. Paul wrote in his letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, 31 to 32, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice, and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. God helps us break the cycle of an unforgiving spirit as we acknowledge our need of forgiveness. Colossians 3.13 says, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. As we battle forgiving others, we should remember that we are forgiven individuals when we yield our lives to Christ. God sets the standard and mentors us in the process of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a debt of sin canceled. Everything that we have done against God all of our lives is forgiven when we ask for forgiveness. Forgiveness is a journey. The awful gulf of sin that separates us from God has been bridged by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can continually walk across that bridge as necessary. When the mind or emotion resurfaces those feelings, we can go immediately to God and ask God to help us deal with the feelings. The fact that forgiveness has taken place does not necessarily mean that feelings won't resurface. It is a process. Forgiveness is also a choice. I choose to forgive as part of my willingness to give it up. Forgiveness is not done without our knowledge. It is not a surprise. It is a choice we make. Forgiveness allows God's love to flow through me to someone else. As a Christian, I cannot hoard Christ's love, but rather I must give it away. Even when hurt comes, I want to demonstrate God's love. I have to be practical in my response, but I must love. God helps us break the cycle of an unforgiving spirit as we acknowledge our need to move forward. Joseph could have been harsh and taken his revenge out on his brothers in response to their actions. He chose to move forward instead. Do not be distressed. And do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, 
And for the next five years, there will be not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. Joseph does not renege on his promise or on his forgiveness. When we find ourselves on a journey of forgiveness, Joseph gives us the answer. The answer to the question is God. As Chuck Swindoll wrote in his final paragraph about Mr. Slagle, for your sake, let me urge you to put away all bitterness now. There's no reason to stay in the POW camp a minute longer. Friends, the escape route is clearly marked. It leads to the cross where the only one who had a right to be bitter wasn't. Amen. Now let us take a few moments to enjoy our ministry of music. God is the source of all goodness. Through our offering, we express our thanks for every good thing we enjoy, and we share good things with those in need. Be generous, as God is generous, so that the world may know that God is good. Now let us bless the gifts brought for God's work as we pray for the people and needs of our world. God of generous love, we bring our gifts with grateful hearts, for we have received so much through your kindness. Bless our gifts and use them to touch lives and situations we cannot even imagine with your love. Make us a blessing in our community for the sake of Christ, our friend and savior. God of all life and each life, you created us and set us in relationship with each other in families and neighborhoods, in communities and countries, in cultures and nations. Today we give you thanks for all the gifts of home life and community celebration which bring meaning and encouragement to our lives. Thank you for the blessings we know through the contributions of those who have gone before us. Help us offer what we can to sustain the well-being of our community and country so that all who make it their home will find security and dignity. God of the whole human family, hear our prayers 
for your world. God of our faith and our future, there are so many pressures we face today, so many problems without simple solutions. Draw near to anyone who is struggling in economic difficulty and all those burdened by challenges to their health and happiness. Guide us through the changing face of this pandemic and support all those who are finding the stress overwhelming. Ease any conflict in homes and workplaces and inspire solutions that express mutual respect and deeper understanding. Help us share with others the hope we find in your presence. God of the whole human family, hear our prayers for your world. God of mercy and forgiveness, you call us to live together in peace and unity. We pray for our neighborhoods and the nations of this world, where people are divided and bitterness turns into resentment. Show us how to work for reconciliation where violence and fear turn neighbor against neighbor or nation against nation. Equip leaders to work for justice that will bring peace. Help us build a world where children enjoy a future filled with good health and happiness. God of the whole human family, hear our prayers for your world. God, our hope and our help, send your spirit to equip our congregation with skill and resilience to weather the challenges of this pandemic that have been brought for our life together. Strengthen friendships new and old and make us a source of encouragement and connection to each other. Lord, we again approach you in silent prayer to give thanks for our blessings and ask your care for our deepest worries. Loving God, help each one find a place and a purpose in our mission and ministry. For it is as your children that we pray together in the words Jesus taught us, in whatever form we know best, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us join in our closing hymn.
join in our benediction responsively. We leave our hearts filled with God's love. We will go to offer the wonders of laughter and hope to meet everyone we will meet. We leave following Jesus into the world. We will serve alongside him in the brokenness of our neighbors and our communities. We leave having heard the whispers of the Spirit we will speak justice to those who would hoard it only for themselves. Go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. Amen. So oh.